as you probably are aware, the book of Revelation is uh, a problem book in general, not because it has to be, but I guess it's because people haven't studied the rest of the Bible enough. And uh, all of the truths that are in Revelation tie in to earlier books and earlier statements of the Bible. And for many years, uh, Protestants tended to say, it just can't be understood, leave it alone, don't even try to uh, study it. Now, I, I suppose, because of some of our work to explain the book of Revelation, we find others trying to explain it also. And I've heard some pretty weird uh, ideas coming supposedly from the book of Revelation. So, it's, uh, it's really important, I believe. One of the reasons it's very important is that the, um, there's a portion of Revelation, a fairly good portion of Revelation, that talks about either our day or the things that are coming in the near future. And so if we don't understand those, then, you know, uh, these events will hit us like COVID did. This seemed like a bolt out of the blue, uh, although I guess some people knew ahead of time, but the general public, they had no idea, and it hit them. And so that's what's going to happen if people don't understand the book of Revelation. So I picked the title, Unraveling Revelation. Actually, we shouldn't have to unravel it, because uh, you'll see here in the first few verses. So if you have your Bible, it'd be good to have a Bible, because uh, everything won't be on the screen. We'll read from the Bible, and then we'll uh, have certain things on the screen. Now this study, we're going to do about uh, 12 possibly 13, depends, uh, studies. We can't do one chapter at a time because there's 22, and that might be too long of a seminar to, you know, to keep everybody coming. So I've put together the first three chapters, done some condensing, hitting the high points, and, uh, and some chapters will go over verse by verse. In verses 1 and 2 of Revelation, it reads, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Now, obviously, when it says God, it's talking about the Father. So, Jesus received the book of Revelation from his Father to show unto his servants so the, the end purpose of the book of Revelation is so that God's servants, in the, in the beginning it was the apostles, and now we usually call our church leaders pastors, and so the message was especially for them so they could present it to their uh, congregations. And then it says, uh, things which must shortly come to pass. So this, of course, was written about 2,000 years ago. And some of the things in Revelation, especially what we're going to talk about tonight, those things were going to happen, or maybe were already happening, some of them. And so uh, that was one purpose of it. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So that explains who the servants are. John was the apostle that received it. So if you, if you put all that together, God the Father gave the book of Revelation, the, you know, the different visions to Jesus. Jesus gave it to the angel, which probably was Gabriel, uh, 
and Gabriel gave it to John. And that's the general way that inspiration comes. That's the path through which it comes. Verse 2, who bear record of the word of God. So in other words, John says, I am testifying to you that this is what was revealed to me. And of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So he put down and he, he names it what it should be called, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And this uh, appears a number of times in the book of Revelation. Then we go to verse 3. It says, Blessed is he that readeth. Does that sound like it's supposed to be hidden? No. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. So God even says, by you listening to it being explained, you should get a blessing. But then there's a third step, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, when it was first written, some of the things are still future, but some of the things, it was the time that they were either going on or going to happen very quickly. So uh, even today though, when we read that verse and we're studying some of the chapters, we should realize, well, the time is at hand. It's not, it's not a long time in the future. So three uh, steps blessing if we read it, blessing if we listen to it, and the biggest blessing if we do what it says. We obey what God has revealed in the testimony of Jesus. Some of you went to the Daniel seminar and notice how different this book is from Daniel. Um, yeah, from Daniel. Daniel 12.4 Gabriel, or whoever gave the message, probably Gabriel. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. So it's a prediction that those things were not going to be understood. Now that doesn't apply to the whole book of Daniel. There were uh, portions of Daniel that could be understood and were understood but there are certain portions of Daniel that this is talking about that was not understood until the time of the end, which came in 1798. That begins the time of the end. And that's when William Miller um, began to discover truths from the book of Daniel and began to explain it. He was the first one uh, to explain that. There were lots of other people that understood the coming of Jesus was very near and preached it all over the world, but they didn't understand some of the things that, that William Miller did and those that worked with him. And it goes on to explain what's going to happen after 1798. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, it's not talking about knowledge in general, but knowledge about the book of Daniel. So it says, this part of Daniel is going to be closed until the time of the end. Then it's going to be understood, and people are going to be studying their Bible to understand it. They're going to be comparing Scripture with Scripture until they can understand what is Daniel talking about here. Now we'll go down to verse 7 in Revelation. By the way, if anyone wants to take notes and you don't have paper, we probably have some there. Anyone? Yeah. Okay, so just grab a piece of paper if you, if you need it. Okay, verse 7 
says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Obviously, that's Jesus' second coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now, that's interesting. Every eye shall see him. One of the most popular doctrines today is about the rapture, the secret rapture. That supposedly all of a sudden people are going to disappear and be, you know, taken up into heaven. And what people don't realize today, unless they study a little, is that this doctrine has not been held for a very long time. This is a new, a very uh, modern invention. All the churches used to teach different, but now they have decided that this is the idea. And so uh, it doesn't agree with this text or other texts in the Bible to have a secret rapture. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Now that would, to many people, would make them think that, you know, those, these people are still alive. But you think if they were in hell, they would be able to see him? No, that doesn't make sense. So, uh, every eye that pierced him indicates and we studied this in Daniel, but uh, Jesus said, when he was being tried, he said to the high priest, the next time you see me, you're going to see me coming in the clouds of heaven. And so that would require a special resurrection for them to be able to see him come. And why would he want them to see him come? Because they were foremost in condemning him and saying he wasn't who he claimed to be. And so in God's understanding of justice, they are required to see and watch how they were fooled by their false study of the Bible. And you know, there's a lot of other people. All the ones that believe the secret rapture are going to get fooled the same way the high priest was. They're going to think that, that they can get raptured and they're going to find out, no, it's not true. But when they find out, it's too late. So we have to study the Bible to make sure what we believe is true. Then it finishes by saying, uh, And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So, Jesus is going to come literally. Every eye is going to see him. Those that are not ready to see him are going to weep and wail because they could have been ready, but they didn't. Uh, they either listened to false interpretations of the Bible or they didn't care about religious things at all. And yet they find out that what they call false is not false. And they should have paid attention to it. So that's an important uh, text there in Revelation 1. Now, verse 10 is another misunderstood text. John said, I was in the Spirit. In other words, Gabriel was busy revealing these things to him. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So apparently when Gabriel began to speak to him, it sounded like a trumpet, a loud voice revealing the, the things that we're studying here tonight. And uh, a lot of people say, well, the Lord's day is Sunday. But the Bible has given us a warning about how we interpret the Bible. In 2 Peter 1.20, it 
says no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So I can't, if, if I'm a Sunday worshiper and I read the Lord's Day, the Bible doesn't allow me to say it's Sunday. I've got to find a text in the Bible that tells me it's Sunday. And if I can't find that, it might not be that. But there is a text that explains what day it is. And it's found in Mark 2, verses 27 and 28. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath wasn't set up just to show who's in charge. That you, uh, you have to obey me, and if you don't, you're in trouble. The purpose of the Sabbath was to be a blessing to us. The Sabbath was made for man. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Notice whose day would be called the Lord's Day. It's the day that Jesus set aside in the very beginning of the Bible as the day of worship for mankind. And so the Lord's day is the Sabbath. Now let's just think uh, logically about this. You know, the Bible's very logical unless our minds are messed up. He had been banished to the Isle of Patmos. This island was where you sent prisoners and it was lonely and there was no church for him to go to unless he uh, converted some of the prisoners, you know, which maybe he did, but we don't have any record of that. And so he had always kept the Sabbath while Jesus was on earth. He kept the Sabbath before Jesus came. It was the Sabbath to keep the seventh day Sabbath. And so on that day, even though he was all alone, at least it seems like this didn't happen in church. You know, he was sitting out there, worshiping on the Sabbath by himself, and all of a sudden this loud voice comes and starts revealing these things to him. And so uh, it would appear logically that this would be the Sabbath day, that that would happen. Now verse 19 in chapter 1, uh, talks about the whole scope of the book. We touched on it in the earlier verses, but it says, verse 19, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, so some things are going on now, and the things which shall be hereafter. So, the book of Revelation essentially goes from the time of John all the way to the end of time. And while Revelation doesn't explain everything in a, in a sequential way, there are a number of sequences, you know, where it does take things from a certain point to another point. But it's not like all the way through the book of Revelation it's doing things sequentially, so... Are these free? Yeah, you can have one of those. Now, I didn't put uh, the next verse down, but it's probably a good one to have. Verse 20. It's kind of the bridge to the next chapter. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. We didn't read that, but in chapter 1, if you read the whole chapter talks about seven stars that Jesus held in his hand and the seven golden candlesticks. So it, it showed Jesus moving around between seven candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now the word angel simply means messenger. Angels are messengers. So, but this is not talking about literal angels. 
It's talking about the pastors or the church leaders of that church. So uh, the seven stars are the leaders of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So every candlestick represented one church, and the star represented the leader of that church. Why? Because the leader has the responsibility to properly train the members of his church and teach the truth uh, to them. However, don't just take his word for it. Be like the Bereans. They listened to Paul, but they went home and they studied the Bible to see if what Paul said was true. Lots of people are going to be lost because they think they have a great pastor and he's telling them the truth and he wasn't telling them the truth because he wasn't a good enough student or he, he didn't want to tell the truth because of certain things that might happen to him. And so, you know, it's dangerous, but if the leader is teaching the truth, then he's a great blessing. So now we're going to look, uh, I'm not going to read all the verses in uh, the next chapter. Oh, I did have it in there. Oh, I put it in later, that's what happened, and then I forgot I did that. Um, now there's going to be seven churches in a row, we'll look at each one just very briefly. But there are actually three different applications of these seven churches. The first application is that in John's day there were churches by the same names that we're going to look at. So they were seven literal churches and each church had certain good points and bad points. Uh, one had only good points and one had only bad points. But most of them had some good points and some bad points. You might wonder, well, why would God pick these churches to uh, present? And that leads us to the second, is that there is also the history of the Christian church is sequential. Going through, in other words, the first church was like the apostolic church. But then the church changed and it became like the next church and the next one. Until finally, it became like the Laodicean church. And this, uh, you know, is a historical application of it. So this sequence begins in John's day and goes all the way till Jesus comes. The third application is that each church today has at least one of the problems. And, you know, I don't know, maybe if, if we were really to be able, which we probably can't, analyze the spiritual condition of every church, we would find out that there's one of these churches that illustrates the way they are. And so they have these problems, or they have these good points, but uh, there's only one that really we should love to be a part of, and that's the Church of Philadelphia. But um, every church fits into one of those, and I guess they should put four. I forgot the fourth one. I believe every individual church member fits into these seven things. You know, we have the same problems that they had back then, and this is trying to reveal to us our problem so that we can get delivered. God is not trying to condemn, but he's just trying to reveal so that we can overcome and not be like that. And like I say, the one that I want to be a part of is Philadelphia. That is the church that really uh, has the best record. So we'll start 
with Ephesus. And uh, in verse 4 of chapter 2, it reveals the problem that this church had. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So the church of Ephesus, when Paul came and preached, to Ephesus and raised up the church it was on fire for God but by the time and of course uh, John was the oldest disciple he lived the longest and died a natural death uh, God revealed that Ephesus has got a problem they have lost their first love now how can you know whether you lost your first love if you can look back at any time in the past that you were more on fire for the Lord than you are now, then you may have lost your first love. Because it's supposed to get better and better. You know, we don't want a marriage where it gets worse and worse. Time goes on. We want one that gets better and better. We're going to be married. But, uh, Unfortunately, this church had not kept up their prayer time, their study time, and as a result, they lost their first love. Now, they were a very busy church, if you read the whole passage. They were, you know, feeding the homeless. They were taking care of those that had drug addictions. They were helping all kinds of people with all kinds of problems. And so God said, you know, you've been a, a hard-working church, but the most important thing to me, you know, to Jesus, is to have your first love. And he said, you don't have that. You, you, you're either losing it or you've lost it. And this is a serious problem. They did have one good point that's interesting. Verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So here is a group of people called Nicolaitans. If God hates the Nicolaitans, we better know who they are so that we don't become one. Now, of course, we're not supposed to hate anybody in the, in the sense of the way we use the word, but the Bible uses the word hate in a, in a different way than what we usually use it. Uh, that is, not every time, but frequently. So what God is saying is here, these people are damaging other people, and when God you know, you've heard of righteous indignation. When he sees that somebody is, is damaging another person, it gives him righteous indignation. And so that's what he's really saying here. Well, who are they? They're mentioned more than once as we go through these churches. Today, many churches teach the same as the Nicolaitans. So here, you know, Satan found a way to, to bring in to the, the Christian circles, even back in the days of John, brought in this false teaching. However, the church of Ephesus said, you're not welcome here. You can't teach that doctrine here in our church. You've got to stay out. And God says, that's good that you said that. And you kept those Nicolaitans out. So, from studying the Bible, what were they teaching? Well, Jude, the book right before Revelation, verse 4, and I took this from the New International Version because it's a little easier to grasp the thought. It says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago, have secretly slipped in among you. You know, that, that's the way the devil loves to do it. 
when false teaching first begins, it's often because somebody sneaked into the church, made believe that they were good members, and they start teaching error. So that's what happened back then. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality. It's another way of saying to give people license to break the commandments and to say it's okay to break the commandments and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Because those commandments were given by Jesus himself, anyone that is encouraging people not to obey those commandments is denying Jesus. And so, you know, God's grace does not excuse disobedience. God's grace is to enable us to obey. Yes, to forgive for the past, what's happened in the past, we can't change. So grace will forgive for the past. But grace will also give power to obey. But if a person doesn't want to obey, then, you know, they're teaching people that it's okay to disobey. Well, years ago, um, many, many pastors taught that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross and that you didn't need to pay any attention to those anymore. However, that is such a false teaching that um, most pastors are not teaching that today. That they realize that, well, then we can murder and we can uh, steal and we can take somebody else's wife. Uh, you know, and they say, well, no, we don't want to teach that. So I heard a preacher, I've only heard one say this, but he was being perfectly honest. And I'll have to give him that. He said, we need to keep all nine commandments. Obviously, he didn't feel we need to keep the fourth commandment, which talks about Sabbath keeping. But he recognized that we shouldn't have idols, we shouldn't swear, we shouldn't steal, we should obey our parents. And he knew that all those still needed to be done. And then, of course, we have one church that really teaches that eight is all that you really need to keep. And the reason is that they make a big deal about idols and images and things. God said, don't make any images in the Ten Commandments. So uh, this undermining of the Ten Commandments is what those that are Nicolaitans do. The doctrine is now largely taught that the gospel of Christ has made the law of God of no effect, that by believing we are released from the necessity of being doers of the word. But this is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Christ so unsparingly condemned. So uh, it's not done quite the same way as it used to be, but they're basically saying, do the best you can, you'll be saved. Just, you know, God's grace will take care of you. If you acknowledge Jesus as your Savior, don't, don't worry how well you keep the law. It doesn't really matter. You, he'll save you anyway. That's the version that we have today. And yet when you ask a question, can you break the commandment of stealing, the answer is no, you, you shouldn't do that. So... It's a little bit conflicted, what is being said. The next one we look at is Smyrna. Now, Smyrna was a persecuted church because uh, those that tried to be faithful, you know, if we look at the historical one, the literal one, of course, Smyrna was in a place where uh, they, they got persecuted. 
And we have people like that today. I mean, over in other countries, uh, the church is persecuted, China is persecuted, and any of the Muslim countries is persecuted. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them are persecuted. They have to try to share their faith in ways that don't look that bad, you know. So uh, it's, it's still going on today. But in the historical one, uh, there came to be a period when the church was heavily persecuted. And interestingly enough, though, you know, none of us like persecution, but the church stays more pure during persecution times than it does when it's not. Next one is Pergamus. And uh, the problem they had, they were allowing those who were tempting other believers to break God's law. And uh, the second problem, they actually allowed members who taught the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So there are two times you can see that God is very displeased with the popular theology today about how you get saved. And, you know, it's not totally off the wall. It's only partially. And that's what makes it so hard for people to see that it's not biblical. So this church was really in bad condition. They were not just saying to the Nicolaitans, you stay out. You can't be a part of the church. Ephesus did that, but not Pergamus. They said, you're welcome in the church, and you can go ahead and teach this in the church. Next one is Thyatira. The problem with them is they allowed members who did what Jezebel did to Israel. And uh, the most prominent thing that Jezebel did to Israel was that she insisted on Baal worship, idol worship. And you probably remember the story of Elijah and his confrontation with Jezebel and the prophets and how he killed those, all those uh, 400 prophets. And on Mount Carmel, he gave those prophets before they got killed to try and see if they could bring fire down from heaven. If you want an is interesting book to read about idols, read the book of Isaiah, especially the second half of it. It's amazing. It's like God kind of laughs at them. He said, why in the world do you worship an idol? You made it. How in the world can you get any benefit from it? And then he tells about what he can do. And so uh, this was a serious problem and you might think that there's no worship of idols in churches today, but unfortunately some idols have become so um, entrenched that they are said to be good. Let me just mention one. I hope I don't offend anybody. Sports. Christians are among the biggest fans of sports that there are today. And all you have to do is take a look at a baseball stadium and consider the amount of money and consider how much money you gotta pay to go there and watch the ball game. And it should give you a pretty good idea that this is idolatry. And the amount of money that the players get paid and how people will get cards and collect cards and you know, they worship that athlete that they feel can do so wonderful. And this, it should be as plain as day to Christians. This is idolatry, just like Jezebel uh, was doing uh, to Israel in her day. It also, I believe that was the one, I don't know why I didn't put it down. It brings up Balaam as well. Now, Balaam, his. Uh, mark of, of degradation 
was to lead the Israelites into sexual immorality. And so unfortunately, in the church of Thyatira, they had both those problems, and it was, it made God very sad to see that condoned in the church. Then, in uh, verse 28 of, of the chapter, it shows us the beginning of the Reformation. So, it's like the church kept going down, 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 until they came to the Reformation. And I imagine you've heard of that, where all the Protestant churches started from, and they broke off from the Catholic Church, and established different uh, churches, and there was a revival. So verse 28 says, And I will give him the morning star. Now, if you study his history about the Reformation, you will discover that Wycliffe is considered the morning star of the Reformation. And it fits historically with where we're at right now. So, from after Wycliffe, who uh, you know got a, a translation of the Bible so the common people could, well, I guess it wasn't the common people yet, but at least the educated people could read the Bible for themselves because the Catholic Church had hindered the people from reading the Bible and uh, didn't want to provide it for them. But now, God has worked to make it possible. And then later, there were translations of the Bible for the common people. Then we go to Sardis. They had a big problem. They acted like they were Christians, but generally were unconverted. Therefore, the Bible considers you dead. If you're not converted, if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, let him take charge of your life. The Bible considers you dead. And so this church had no good points. Now, it's interesting that it came just after the beginning of the Reformation. So what it's telling us is that those churches that started out pure not perfectly pure, but at least, you know, uh, commendably pure. These churches that started out that way lost it. When did they lose it? Well, if we study the great revival that happened in the middle 1800s under William Miller and others who were part of it, you discover that a point came when those churches said, if you believe that Jesus is coming in the near future, and finally October 22, 1844, <coughs> if you believe that, we're going to disfellowship you. And so what happened was that they ended up disfellowshipping all of the converted people, and they were left with all the unconverted people. And so the church became dead. And God had to take the ones that were living, and he had to develop another church, which is the next one. However, in chapter 3, verse 4, notice what it says. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against, no, I'm in two, sorry. Three, verse four. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So, those churches that, that you know, fell into a poor spiritual condition, still had some faithful people in them. They didn't understand, maybe, fully, but they were, their heart was right. 
with Jesus. And so that's why we never should condemn anyone in any church because we don't read the higher, we don't know whether they are spiritually alive or not. Now we can see the false teaching that's generally there, but we cannot condemn the individual because there's always faithful souls in, in every church. Now we come to Philadelphia. <coughs> Verses 7 and 8 of chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. <coughs> Again, we have a key as to when that was. There was a time when a door in heaven was closed and a door in heaven was open. And if we can figure out when that happened, we know when the Philadelphia church existed. Now, this connects, which often we'll find that Daniel and Revelation uh, they enlighten us about each other. And so here is the text that Philadelphia was wrapped up with. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So obviously it was not an earthly sanctuary because that ceased when Jesus died on the cross. They didn't, they didn't uh, follow that earthly sanctuary anymore. So it has to be the heavenly one. That up in heaven a door was shut and another door was open. This is reference to the Day of Atonement when the sins were removed from the sanctuary. You see, on the Day of Atonement, the priest in the Old Testament sanctuary, he didn't work in the uh, same way on that day. It's like he closed the door of the holy place and opened the door into the most holy place, <coughs> typifying what would happen in the heavenly sanctuary. The door to the holy place ministry was closed and the door to the Most Holy Ministry was started. This began on October 22, 1844, which was the end of the 2300-day prophecy. After this time, God especially helps us to overcome sin so we can pass the judgment. So the Day of Atonement was considered by the Jews a judgment. And when we're being judged, God is looking at what we're doing. And we can always have forgiveness from Jesus, but the time comes when we cannot continue to disobey, especially on purpose. We cannot keep on disobeying because he cannot cover disobedience unless we get to the place where we're sorry we did it. And uh, there's a limited time as well on that. So this Philadelphia church starts approximately when the people started getting excited about the message that Jesus was coming and certainly when they got disfellowshipped and thrown out of the church because of their love for Jesus coming they were full of love for Jesus. They were Philadelphia. And there's nothing mentioned wrong with Philadelphia. It also probably extends a little while after 1844 because they kept their fervor for God for a while. It looks like maybe 10, 10 years, maybe 11 the most. This 
was the period of time when the church was just like the old time church of Philadelphia. You went there and you realized, wow, all these people just love Jesus with all their heart. And they really want to please him by doing what he said as best they can and always asking forgiveness if they disobey. And what a wonderful church it was to be a part of. And there are wonderful accounts of what it was like to be a part of the Philadelphia church as well. And this is, uh, you know, the one that we need to belong to in a sense. Not, not that we can go back in history, but these verses show that some will try to open the door of the holy place. You see, there's always people who are activated by Satan. They don't like that new door they got open. And they like the old one. They want to keep the old one open. That's what our text told us. Um, Verse 7 there uh, says, He that openeth and no man shutteth. In other words, man would try to shut it. But God says, No, you can't shut it. And shutteth and no man openeth. So some individuals say, We want to open this door back up. And God says, No, you can't do that. I've opened this other one. And that's going to stay open, and this one's going to stay shut. Now, you might wonder, what's the difference between living under the holy place versus living under the most holy place? Well, in the most holy place, the, the, there weren't too many things in there, but there was God's throne, you know, uh, in uh, uh, example of God's throne. It was the Ark of the Covenant with two angels standing at the end and there was the mercy seat underneath where they were taught to see that God sits there. That this is his throne room up in heaven. Well that means he moved his throne from the holy place to the most holy place. If we're going to still try to open the door of the holy place it's like it, it's empty in a way. God's not there. We're not going to connect with God there. He's moved to the most holy place, and that's the place to connect with God. In fact, when people are confused about this, Satan can even uh, make believe he's in the holy place. No, he can't go to heaven, but you know he will. He will answer their prayers instead of God answering them because they don't know that they're not reaching God the only place they can reach him is in the most holy place another thing that we need to be aware of that's changed <laughs> is that in the holy place you could sin and repent sin and repent sin and repent but in the most holy place, you can't keep doing that because it's judgment. And you have to come to the place where you've learned to take hold of his power and stop sinning. That doesn't happen overnight. It's something that's, you know, a long, hard battle. But that is what Jesus stands ready to do. Also, he always, he can still forgive for sins and up to a certain point, you know, he can forgive. So we want to keep our sins confessed and we want to take hold of the power that's available to grow in the Christian life. Don't worry about how fast you're growing, just be interested in taking hold of that power and growing because that is the most holy place to experience. The final church was the Laodiceans. And sad to say, uh, we passed by the Philadelphia church 
about 1855 or 6. And there were no longer any Philadelphia uh, denominations. Now, individual churches, yes. An individual church can be a Philadelphia church. An individual Christian can be a Philadelphia Christian. So it's not like you're stuck, you know, with these conditions. You can be different. But when we look at a, a whole denomination, they're laid to sin. All of them are laid to sin. Laid to sin had three problems. They were lacking in love and faith. The two most important things for the Christian to have, faith 